was always very funny and he was always full of pranks and he was always being silly. But on the other end of the spectrum, with, when it had to do with the security of Israel and all that stuff, he was so serious. But that's, I guess that's, that's Mike. That was, you know, it was the wool hat and the baseball and the hockey. Shalom. Shalom Um But Israel was always there. I've really just never seen somebody just thrive and, and, and just love Israel like he did. He had such a passion for it and, and no matter what was going on here, he, he, he had nothing bad to say about Israel, which was just amazing because it's very hard to be a, a new immigrant here by yourself and to deal with Israeli bureaucracy and everyone complains and, and there's nothing, what are you going to do, that's how it is. But, but Mikey, no matter what, he, he had that characteristic smile on his face and he'd say, well, you know, this and this happened, but, but I'm loving it here. Last thing Michael said to us, he says, don't worry about me. He says, I'm going to exactly where I want to go. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So Michael went into this with open eyes, as I'm sure all those other Israeli soldiers did too. It's the price we pay for defending. When the Second Lebanon War broke out, Michael was here on vacation at his parents' house. Without hesitation, he returned to Israel to his unit, but found out to his disappointment that his commanders decided not to let him go into Lebanon with the rest of his comrades. He says, I didn't come back here to go to Hebron. And Michael was very, very determined. And by the end of the day, he was able to convince his superiors before entering Lebanon, Michael called his sisters for the last time. You know, just in case something happens, I just want to say I love you. And I said, yeah, things going to be fine. What are you talking about? I'll talk to you later. He's like, I love you. I'll talk to you later. And that was it. It was like a 60-second conversation. He said to me, just saying he was going into Lebanon and to know that if anything happens to him, he will always be with me. And then he said, I'll talk to you later. But obviously, I never did talk to him later. It's a dream come true. Something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means. To Michael's me. desire to defend the land of Israel. My father was a decorated combat veteran of the Second World War, and Michael was named after him. Uh, Michael's Hebrew name was Melech, which means king in Hebrew. In high school, Michael went to Israel with several of his friends from Council Rock High School. And I really think that that was the changing point for Michael. He was in love with the land. He was in love with the people. I remember the first day he came to me and said, but I must tell you, after the year of Nativ, I'm going to join the Israeli army. For someone to come at the first day of the program and to like declare and say it's make a statement, I'm coming back to Israel to serve in the Israeli army, was really an exceptional thing. My papers are done, I'm making Aliyah to Israel, I'm leaving. He had been waiting weeks, even months, for his admission papers, which never came. So he decided to take matters into his own hands, went down to the admissions building, tried to gain entrance through the front door, he was stopped by two armed guards, said to him, papers, he said, I have no papers, that's why I'm here. So he walked around the back of the building, he looked up at the second floor and saw a window open about three or four inches. So, being at the back of the building, he found a dumpster that he pushed across the way against the building. He climbed on the dumpster, climbed up the bars of the first floor window, pushed the window open, tumbled into the men's room on the second floor of the building, found the appropriate office, walked in. The man says, next. Michael sits down. He says, papers. Michael says, I don't have any papers. He says, son, you can't get through the front door of this building unless you have papers. Michael said, what makes you think I came through the front door? And he told him the story of how he got in. And the man said to him, you know, I've been here about 20 years. You're the first person to actually break into this building to get into the army. He says, sit down, we'll fill out your papers. It's a dream come true, something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means to me. It's a good one. I saw him training. 
I know. You're working very, very hard. And I'm... Michael just took his keep off his head and he said, here, take mine. Put it on, it's my throw. He looked at me and said, all right, you ready now? I said, yeah, I'm ready. Let me give it back to him. Put it on his head. before he went to the army. He called to me sometime in Yom Shishi, and I said, hello, I'm Michael Levine, and people say that if I want to go to the army, you are the man. Listen, Mike, I don't know you. To put your name, I have to meet you. I spoke with all the young kids in the Ulpan who came to learn Hebrew, and I met a young fellow, very small one, with a kippah on his head, and all the time, he's smiling and smiling and smiling. Mike, what do you smile all the time? I don't know, but put me in a parachute unit. I'm smiling, but I'm, I'm strong. Don't worry. Mike, go to eat some chicken, some cheese, bread. Be fat a little bit. It's okay. I'm That's the truth, man. No pain, no game. You don't take the pain, you're not going to go into the... A dream come true. Something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means to me. It's a good one. I saw him training. I know. You're working very, very hard, and I'm, I'm proud of him. Michael became very close friends. Oh 